the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. The Syrian dictator's crackdown on opposition forces is escalating. Six straight days of heavy bombardment has left hundreds dead in homes. As rocket and mortar fire rained down on neighborhoods in the country's third largest city, Russia and China vetoed a United Nations resolution calling for President Bashar Assad to cede power. The UN estimates that more than 5,400 people have been killed in Syria since the protests against Assad began 11 months ago. But getting an accurate account of what's happening on the ground is impossible. That's because the Syrian government has cracked down on local journalists and denied access to most foreign reporters. International observers have left the country, fearing for their lives. The International Press Institute has been urging the Syrian government to end the media blockade. And Human Rights Watch has been tracking attacks on civilians by using a network of sources. Joining us today to talk about the developments in Syria are Ule Solvang and Anthony Mills. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Ule is an emergencies researcher at Human Rights Watch and co-author of a recent in-depth report on human rights abuses in Syria. Anthony Mills is the Press Freedom and Communications Manager for the International Press Institute. Um, Anthony, video smuggled out of Syria shows unarmed demonstrators being shot down, uh, and correspondents who have managed to sneak into Syria report that many civilians are being killed by the bombings. But what are Sir Syrians hearing on, on the state-controlled media about what's happening? Well, what Syrians are hearing on the uh, state-controlled media is that this is all the work of, uh, quote, armed gangs um, and or militants of various stripes. Uh, there's absolutely no mention of um, unarmed civilians being killed by Syrian government forces or the Syrian uh, army. On the contrary, this is all sort of um, the, the finger is being pointed at um, thugs, criminals, um, armed elements. And then as well, we're seeing something on Syrian state uh, media, which is kind of similar to what was on um, state media in other countries, other Arab countries where there were the uprisings, which is the suggestion that there's a foreign hand playing a role here. This is some sort of a conspiracy targeting Syria, uh, but absolutely no mention of unarmed uh, civilians being killed by their own government. Right. And, and Ule, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, put out a re report uh, today, I believe. What, uh, what are the highlights of that report about what's happening in Syria? Well, as you mentioned in your introduction, since uh, last Friday, the uh, Syrian military forces have launched large-scale attacks on several populated areas in Syria. And one of the places that has been worst affected is uh, it's the city of Homs, which is the, la uh, the third la largest city in Syria and has been a bit of a, a center for the anti-government demonstrations. Um, for five or six days now, the uh, government forces have been sh uh, basically surrounding these populated areas, um, preventing people from leaving, preventing people from entering this area. They have cut electricity, they have blocked food delivery and medicine delivery into the area, and they have been shelling, um, shelling the area with no concern in terms of how many civilians uh, are being killed. And, um, it is incredibly hard to get accurate information out about what is going on, but we believe that at this point more than 300 people have been killed in, in less than a week from, from this shelling. And Anthony, what's the environment like for, for journalists in, in, in Syria? It's extremely uh, difficult, even at the, the best of times. I, uh, before joining the International Press Institute, I was actually a correspondent based in Beirut for a number of years and, and reporting for CNN, among others, and uh, also reported from, from Syria. And I can tell you that um, even before this uprising erupted, there was uh, no independent media to speak of in Syria. It's an utterly closed society, the police state. Uh, and so even before this uprising, there was no real independent uh, media. Following the start of the uprising, uh, things got 
got even worse, particularly with respect, though, to um, what, what we call citizen journalists. I mean, people who, who, are, who are not professional journalists, per se, but are on the ground and have access to various devices uh, and social media and are getting out this vital information uh, from uh, the uh, places like Homs uh, about what is going on. The challenge, though, is uh, verifying this information precisely because it is not being brought out by professional independent journalists. Uh, but by um, citizen journalists, activists, um, and so on. So it's, it's a real challenge. And we see mainstream uh, international media organizations and others relying on this footage, albeit with the caveat that it can't be verified. For those handful of foreign journalists who have either been allowed in on government visas uh, or have been smuggled in, such as the BBC correspondent who recently spent a number of days in Homs, Things are extremely dangerous. We saw the um, French TV correspondent who was killed uh, in, in, in an attack, in a, in a, a, a sort of an, an explosion uh, in Syria just a couple of weeks ago or so. Uh, a lot of uncertainty surrounding who may have been responsible for that. Um, and we've seen other journalists threatened and um, dealt with in an extremely harsh manner. One only needs to imagine what would happen to a journalist, even a foreign journalist, if they were caught inside Syria uh, without a government visa. Right. And Uli, how, is, how does this compare with what you're uh, hearing and finding out in Syria? I think I think it is absolutely accurate. I think it is extremely difficult and dangerous at this point uh, to to get information verified. Um, I mean, but there, there are ways of of doing that, and uh, you know, we always try to verify to the extent possible information before we put it out. And there's different ways we try to track down the people who have, you know, filmed the incident in question and uploaded it, uh, uploaded it on YouTube, uh, or we try to talk to other witnesses who were present at the at the at the scene of the incident. There. Um, you know, it, it is becoming extremely difficult, particularly when the army is launching large-scale m m military operations, because as a rule, they usually cut electricity, they cut, uh, they cut phone, uh, phone lines as well. So getting through to people is extremely difficult, and the only people in many cases were able to reach are those that have satellite phones. But in addition to that, I think one of the very important ways that we at least use to verify information is by going to the neighboring countries and talk to refugees, talk to defectors from the military, interview them at length, and in that way being able to verify some of the information that have come out uh, on YouTube uh, or on blogs or, or in other ways. Yes, I, I noticed in your report you interview people separately, um, cross-reference uh, details. Um, what are some other ways that – and I know you've been using uh, defectors from the Army also to bolster the, the case that uh, uh, there are uh, crimes against uh, humanity here. Could, could you talk about uh, that, uh, the way you use these defectors from the Army? Well, I mean, there, there are many different – there are different ways that, that we approach uh, our research and – and there are different ways in which we verify our research. And, and the methodology that we use on Syria is no different from the methodology that we use in, in many other countries. Uh, most of the information that we collect is based on in-depth, detailed interviews with first-hand witnesses. And very often those are uh, victims themselves, uh, or they can be uh, witnesses. Um, uh, what is really unique in many ways about the situation in uh, Syria is that there is such a large number of defectors and defectors who have left the country that we can interview. And that has really uh, given us um, a, a very deta detailed insight in terms of uh, how the military and the security agencies are structured, where they are deployed, who are the commanders, uh, you know, who gave orders to do what. Uh, so a report that we put out in uh, December was based on, the, on interviews with, uh, with uh, more than 60 of these defectors. And in, in that report, uh, we named uh, more than 70 officers and commanders who we believed 
should be investigated for their role in, in the crackdown on demonstrators, uh, violations that, uh, that we believe uh, are crimes against humanity. Right. Sounds like you're building a, a court case. How do you court your sources and how do you ensure them uh, that they will uh, be safe if they return or their, that their families are going to be safe? Well, I think in, in all our research, and, and particularly in Syria, where we know that the security and intelligence agencies are so active, they have such a wide network and such a wide reach, and they're so brutal, uh, the, the safety of witnesses and the people we speak to is really paramount for us. And, and that's, that's something that really plays into the in, entire research process from how we approach people uh, we always try to make sure that people have a choice whether they they talk to us or not, so that you know they're not suddenly just you know finding themselves in a room with a bunch of foreigners and only then find out that it is you know this international human rights organization that they are supposed to speak with. Um, to making sure that the information that we collect that it's stored safely, that it is encrypted if it is on computers, and to the way that we publish the information, making sure that we. Uh, if people have requested anonymity, that we do not uh, disclose any information about their identity, any other information that can, um, that can uh, help somebody identify who they are. And in Syria in particular, as a rule, um, particularly when we talk to vi victims, uh, we, uh, and, you know, it's better, better to be safe than sorry. So in, in those cases, we, we have insisted on anim anonymity for all our victims. Anthony, what's, uh, what do you see as uh, being necessary uh, to, for the situation to change and f for uh, international monitors to come back and possibly for uh, uh, the government to relent and allow correspondence in? Will it take just more international pressure? Or what, what do you see as, as, as coming up next? I think the, the situation uh, in the case of Syria is one that is extremely uh, complex because of the interconnectivity of Syria with the rest of the Middle East um, and indeed in terms of allies and, and Russia and China vetoing any Security Council um, resolution. And so unfortunately I think there is the prospect uh, of a continuation of the, the violence. Um, in, the, in the meantime, the quandary remains the same, at least from a news gathering perspective. Um, even the BBC journalist who spent several days in Homs, left Homs, has now left Homs, and as I understand it is now uh, in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, which uh, is a far safer place to be right now. Um, and so basically, independent news witnesses on the ground uh, are virtually non-existent in Homs. One can only imagine the kind of environment that, that is existing there right now. Now, it is true, obviously, that we're seeing the emergence still uh, of footage from, from inside Homs. But as I say, um, it, it, it is very difficult to verify the, the, the authenticity of that footage, although taken as a whole, it certainly paints uh, a very, very stark picture. Right. Um, I think it is true to say as well as, as um, uh, the, the gentleman from Human Rights Watch was uh, saying uh, that it is possible to build up a very strong picture from speaking to people who are believed to um, have witnessed uh, the, uh, the events that are unfolding inside Syria, who are maybe refugees or who are defectors and whose independent uh, accounts of, uh, of what is happening there um, really kind of paint a, a very stark picture as well. Um, but from a, from a from a news gathering perspective, from a sort of a media perspective, um, it's, it's, it's not a complete replacement for um, actually having journalists on the ground. Unfortunately, shutting journalists out and creating a, a kind of a vacuum or attempting to create a vacuum is something that is not new in Syria. It is not new uh, even uh, throughout the other Arab countries in which we've seen uprisings wherever there are situations in which there are military operations, and particularly in situations where dictators are seeking to cling on to power, they attempt to create um, a complete kind of news shutdown. Um, and there's an enormous challenge involved 
encountering that shutdown. Uh, I do believe that very courageous journalists, um, whether, whether, whether Syrian or other, will continue to try to document what is going on there independently. I think we will continue to see journalists being smuggled into Syria and trying to report independently from there. But it is an extremely dangerous right. uh, um, uh, thing to do. And I think, unfortunately, that the, the challenges will continue to grow. And before I uh, uh, will ask you about your take on the international response, uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to today's program on our website. Please send us your questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. So, so Ule, how would you characterize the international response and what do you foresee as happening in the in the coming weeks? Well, I'm, it, it's difficult because uh, Russia and China's veto at the Security Council uh, really has paralyzed the Security Council for the time being. Um, but, but there are still, uh, I mean, there are still options, and the international community definitely should not give on, up on this issue uh, yet. There needs to be continued discussions at the Security Council. There needs to be continued pressure on Russia and on China. Uh, there, there is really a, a huge burden on Russia and China now because they have obstructed uh, international, uh, strong international action. They really need to show that they are capable of stopping Assad. And if they can't do so in a very short time period, they need to change their position and go back and, and allow Security Council to step in. At the same time, uh, the General Assembly at the UN is another avenue um, where uh, Syria can be discussed, where countries can take action, come together uh, um, around resolutions. And we've also seen, of course, that the Arab League has played a very important role. And it is really important that both the Arab League, the EU, the U.S., Canada and others who uh, feel strongly about ending the violations in Syria, that they come together. There has been talk about a, um, a group of uh, friends of Syria, that they continue the sanctions, that they expand the sanctions to the extent that they're believed to be effective, and, and that there's really continued strong pressure on Assad to stop these horrific violations. Right. And would it help to have the uh, the Arab League is talking now about uh, uh, sending once again sending in international observers. H how would that help the situation? Well, I mean, you know, it, it's one of many many measures that can be taken. Having people, independent observers, on the ground is never going to hurt. And and to the extent that it is possible, uh, I think it would be a good thing. The, what we saw uh, with the observer mission when it was sent in back in December was that it, it was not, you know, for all its good its intentions, it was not properly prepared. Uh, there were some questions about the composition and the background and the, um, and, and the qualifications of the observers. There were questions about whether it had the resources that it needed, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, keeping in mind that this, was, this, this has been the first observer mission like this uh, deployed by the Arab League, it is perhaps not surprising. I think what is important now is that the Arab League has uh, recognized that it, it might need some help. It has, it has approached the UN and the UN has promised support and help. Um, but the biggest problem with the observer mission when it was launched in December was really that it was manipulated by the Syrian government. Right. And uh, of course the government will try to do that again and the extent to which such an observer mission will be uh, successful or effective is dependent on whether they will be able to not let themselves be manipulated by the Syrian government to yeah. only go to the places, for example, that the Syrian government wants them to go, but to actually go to the places where the violations occur. And, and Anthony, does having this kind of observer mission, uh, does that help provide cover to journalists? How, how, does, how, do, they, how, does that, how do they work together? Unfortunately, I, I have to say that I, I don't think it does. Um, I do believe, of course, uh, that, that having independent observers on the ground, um, as was just said, um, you know, c c c can't hurt per se. Um, unfortunately, though, I think that um, the view uh, from, from, from the regime may very well be that this kind of buys some time. 
Um, and, and indeed, I think what we're seeing here is a feeling that, that time is being bought. Time is being bought by a, by all accounts, failed initial Arab observer mission, um, by a failed, uh, indeed, I think two in total failed attempts to pass a resolution at the UN Security Council. Um, and, and so um, in, in the interim, uh, the, the, the atrocities continue. Um, even when the observers are there, I would argue that they're unlikely to be able to provide a great deal of cover to journalists primarily as well, because they tend to be taken to places um, uh, which the, the government wants them to see, uh, as opposed to the places that the government doesn't want them to see, and particularly in the, in the areas where, where uh, the, the atrocities are being committed and where journalists are likely to want to go, that's where the danger is greatest. It's worth bearing in mind as well that the, um, the French journalist from uh, France, too, who was killed just a few weeks ago, was, um, as I understand it, until very shortly before he actually died, in the company uh, of Syrian soldiers. Um, he was there on a state-sanctioned uh, visit to Syria, as I understand it. He had a visa. Um, he was there with the full um, uh, blessing, if you will, of, of the Syrian government and the Syrian state. Um, and yet, even with that blessing, um, he, he ended up dead, uh, starkly highlighting the threats faced by journalists, even when they are theoretically there um, with, the, with the blessing of the Syrian government and are among the very small number of foreign journalists allowed in. So um, I think that, unfortunately, for as long as this violence continues, for as long as these atrocities continue, and for as long as there is uh, upheaval like this in Syria, an attempt to uh, distort the, the image that is coming out, distort the information that is coming out, and intimidate, because that's what it is, intimidate uh, journalists, whether they're Syrian or others, um, we're going to see a continued risk to, to journalists. Um, and I fear that the situation will get worse before it gets better. So... What what can the international community do, Anthony, to to help journalists cover the country? I think that there is the, the, the you address with that question the, the broader issue of the safety of journalists, which is something that, um, that that the International Press Institute seeks very strongly to promote, along with a whole number of other organisations, um, and and that is that. Every country, every government, um, uh, every state has an obligation to um, seek to ensure the safety of journalists, to respect the independence of journalists operating in conflict zones and elsewhere, um, and, and certainly to do their best to, to ensure that journalists are not um, targeted in attacks. Unfortunately, far too often, governments either turn a blind eye to attacks on journalists or actually actively seek to endanger journalists. What the international community can do, and unfortunately it's not always effective and not all institutions and organizations within the international community are uh, dedicated enough to this, but what they should seek to be doing is putting very, very strong pressure uh, on governments and countries that are, see that are seen to be uh, violating uh, the right of journalists to operate safely and independently. Um, through various bodies. In the case of Syria, uh, I think that it is part of the overall effort to seek to hold people to account for crimes committed, um, to send the message that the international community and international organizations, whether they're NGOs or other institutions, such as the United Nations Human Rights Council, that they're watching very carefully, that they're watching uh, all violations very carefully and documenting them, and that there is no statute of limitations on serious crimes against humanity. Yeah, but speaking of that, uh, Ule, what's the Human Rights Watch strategy forward? Are they... Uh, going to try to build a case uh, against the uh, Assad regime? And well, well, I mean, we are going to continue to do our work, and which is to document these violations, to, to publish information about these violence, violations, and then to try to, try to end them. Uh, and, of course, a lot of the information that, uh, that we are collecting will hopefully someday uh, be part of uh, an investigation and prosecution of those who were responsible, whether that takes place in domestic, court, domestic courts in Syria at some time in the future 
or whether that, you know, whether the Security Council decides to refer Syria to the International Criminal Court, we, we don't know yet. But we, you know, we are convinced, based on all the conflicts that we work in, worked in, um, that uh, ending impunity, holding people responsible for the violations, is uh, needed for, um, for, for, for there to be uh, a, a long-lasting peace and, and for there to be uh, justice. And, of course, it is uh, extremely important for the victims of these violations. Anthony, can you uh, speak just briefly about the importance of uh, having independent reporting in Syria moving forward? I think that clearly what we are seeing, in addition to a brutal attempt to suppress an uprising, is an equally brutal attempt to eliminate any form of independent reporting uh, about what is going on in Syria right now, about the atrocities that are being committed there, about the onslaught. Um, and we're seeing that in, in terms of the um, uh, refusal to grant virtually any foreign reporters access to the country, uh, the efforts to channel the reporting of those handful that um, are allowed into the country, um, the uh, brutal suppression of any attempts by Syrian journalists, including citizen journalists, to okay. report uh, on the uprising. And um, uh, so in that context, I think it's even more important Great. to continue that dogged uh, attempt to document things independently. Okay, well, th thanks for that. We've, we've come to the end of this week's edition of Global Journalist, uh, produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute uh, by the Missouri School of Journalism. Joining us today were Ule Solvang from Human Rights Watch and Anthony Mills of International Press Institute. Thank you for providing a fascinating perspective on the crisis in Syria, and, and uh, I hope that uh, your work is, is help, helps the journalists and helps people get this information. Thank you. Thank you. And Global Journalist is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers, and Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Now stay tuned for pre Free Press Watch and join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. And now, Free Press Watch, a segment on Global Journalist where each week we bring you a rundown of major events affecting press freedom around the world. I'm Lainey Mullen. Today's news comes from the BBC, the Committee to Protect Journalists, and Reporters Without Borders. Last month in Iran, at least 10 journalists were jailed. The increase in arrests served to intimidate other journalists before parliamentary elections in March. Persian relatives of BBC staff have also been harassed and detained. This week in Ecuador, two journalists were found guilty of defamation and ordered to pay President Rafael Correa $1 million each. The journalists had published a book revealing that the president's brother held $600 million worth of state contracts. The contracts were canceled, but the president sued continuing his pattern of using lawsuits to discourage critical journalists. In Russia, demonstrators are making an impact on mainstream media. Telev television stations NTV and Pirve Canal have started airing dissident voices, even at peak viewing times. Journalists, though, still face risks. Last week, the offices of an opposition party weekly were firebombed. No one was injured, but records and property were destroyed. Motivation for the early morning attack was not known. For more information on these and other events affecting press freedom around the world, please visit our website at globaljournalist.org. Thank you for joining us this week on Global Journalist. I'm Lainey Mullen. See you next week.